Good morning, everyone. I'm Amber Gunst. I'm the CEO of Austin Technology Council. We are thrilled to have you join us today um, with Better Up. And um, just a couple of quick things. We once again are using Slido for the Q&A portion of the program. The Slido code today is 33695. Again, that is 33695. So please put all of your questions into Slido and we'll be able to cover those through the program. I'm gonna now pass everything over to Kate Ross with Better Up and allow her to do a quick introduction for our topic today, as well as the company. Kate, thank you so much. Thank you, Amber. Good afternoon, everyone. We're so excited to be here. I have my colleague Maya with myself. We are so excited to talk about the employee experience with you today. Specifically, what does that look like in times of uncertainty and chaos? So just a quick introduction. Again, my name is Kate Ross. I'm a leadership development consultant here with BetterUp. I'm actually local here to Austin, Texas. So I live here in downtown Austin and I have with me Maya Garza, one of our PhDs. Maya is our regional vice president of behavioral science. So she is a true expert in the field of human behavior. And she is going to be spending a majority of our presentation today interacting with you, educating you around data and the science behind what we're seeing in terms of the employee experience as it relates to the current situation that we all find ourselves in. And then my role at BetterUp is to work with organizations to help you think and act differently to support your people in this not only new world of work, but just new world in general that we're now living in. So with that, let's kick off today's agenda. We have three main themes that we are super excited to talk about with you today. The first is, what does it look like to live in a time of chaos? How do we navigate these new waters? How are people coping and what do they expect for the future? The second is the employee need. How are people leveraging the support around them right now? And the third is a new perspective on understanding basic human thriving. What is this concept of employee experience? How do we define it? What is it comprised of? And what does it look like in this new reality that we find ourselves in? So we're super excited to hear from you. Using Slido, the Q&A chat feature, share with us what brings you here today. You can just type in A, B, C, or D. So is it networking with peers? B, are you just here to learn more? C, are you looking to gain specific insight around how COVID and the current situation is impacting your employees? Or perhaps it's D, getting tips for what you as an organization and as a leader within your organization can be doing to help your people right now. So again, just type A, B, C, or D into the chat feature. We have a D. Would love to hear from some other folks. What brought you here today? Perhaps it's a combination. Anyone else want to be brave and share why they're here? Someone said C, gaining more insight on COVID and the impact it's having on the worker. We have one D, one C. Anyone else would like to share? We'll give it five more seconds so we can be mindful on time. We have another D. Okay. Anyone else? Two more seconds. Okay, so we have two Ds and a C. So let me share with you why Maya and I are here. We are on a mission here at Better Up to help people live their lives with greater clarity, purpose, and passion. And we know from the data that Maya will take us through that this is more important now than ever before, given the state of the world that we are in. We know that organizations and businesses can only grow and thrive when the people inside those businesses and organizations can grow and thrive. So how do we do this? How do we bring this mission to life? We know that growth is personal. So what motivates me is different than what motivates Maya and is different than what motivates you or your team or your partner. And so how we do this, how we bring this to life is we put a professional coach 
in the pockets of employees at all levels of your organization. So not just executive leadership, uh, executive leadership, not just the C-suite, although we can and do support these folks, we're most excited to support folks that have never had personalized development support before. The mid-level managers, we refer to these folks as the forgotten middle. New leaders, people that are leading and managing for the first time ever. Folks that are in some sort of major life transition, like being a new parent for the first time. And we know, and the evidence and science tells us that one-on-one -on -one personalized support is the most effective way to help people to develop the mindset, skills, and behaviors necessary to lead as leaders and to inspire as leaders, but also to thrive as human beings. So we'll get into some juiciness around resilience and optimism that Maya will walk us through. It's both the leadership and the human skills that we coach folks through. Our experience is fully integrated and holistic. So while coaching is our bread and butter, that's the main avenue that we, that we help to support people, we know and the science tells us that so much of the growth that happens at an individual and organizational level happens between coaching sessions. So we have curated micro learning resources that are available on our platform. We have 360 feedback tools. And so this experience is meant to be a fully integrated learning experience beyond just one-on-one -on -one coaching. The three pillars that support this whole person approach that we take to learning and development are grounded on science, technology, and human connection. These are the three pillars that allow us to do what we do and be really effective in that. So what do I mean by science-based? And Maya is going to walk us through a lot of the, the science related to this. Just a quick highlight, we've invested over $20 million in our research and development arm, which we refer to as Better Up Lab. So this is where we do all of our great research around the data behind human behavior and how that evolves over time. We have a world-class science board with folks like Marty Seligman, the father of positive psychology, and Adam Grant, who is a thought leader in organizational psychology. We have a team of PhDs, so Maya is a leader within that team. We have folks that are full-time employees that have backgrounds and are experts in behavioral science. Ultimately, everything we do is science-informed, and this has been val validated by the thousands of users across the globe that we support. So in the spirit of science, and because so much of our model is founded on positive psychology, we thought we could kick today off with a really fun and interactive exercise to get us grounded in the present moment. So I'll just have you close your eyes if you feel comfortable doing so. And think about what you're really grateful for in this moment. And bring it to your mind's eye. Make it really clear. See everything that you see in that image. Feel all the feelings associated with that experience, that person, that place, that thing. What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you taste? What does that experience feel like? Recognizing that when we bring more attention to the goodness in our lives and feel grateful for those things, more and more of the goodness shows and we can con continue to grow and focus on the positive things in our life. So with that, thank you so much. We're so excited to kick things off. I will turn it over to my colleague, Maya, again, who's an expert to walk us through what is the employee experience? Why do why does it matter? And we'll we'll dive into some really interactive discussion here. It is I love that gratitude challenge that that Pete took us through. Um, it's actually um, a science backed technique that is often used in the healthcare space um, to help those workers get grounded and and feel the the positive things in their life and be able to bring uh, a, a more resilient spirit to their work. So it's a really great exercise. Um, if you're ever feeling a little bit down or um, seeing more more of the negative, that's a great way to, to pull yourself back up. So thank you again, um, everyone, for, for having us. Really looking forward to sharing the insights we've been gathering on what is going on with employees during COVID. Um, 
looking forward to also hearing from you and sharing some ideas with you and learning from you as well. So I'll reiterate the Slido code, which is 33. 695 because we'll we'll ask you here and again to chat with us um, in that Q&A function. So I know it's called Q&A, but we're going to use it a little bit as a chat to get you guys um, engaged in the conversation with us. So very much looking forward to hearing from all of you. And I would love to just give it a test. Um, let me know, guys. Um, are you using Slido right now? I'd love to just get a yes in the Slido Q&A just to see. Give me a thumbs up. Give me a yes if you're using Slido right now. Um, and again, do that in the, in the Q&A. I'm going to watch for that to stream in. Love it. Thank you, guys. I'm getting my yeses coming in. Um, go ahead and keep them coming. All right. So, so let's dive in. Now, why start with employee experience, especially right now? The reality is if I was talking to you about two or three months ago, I would have started sharing something like this, what's on this slide, that job openings, hires, quits, those reached historic highs in 2018. It was a very different world that we were in. And in fact, voluntary turnover, so people quitting because they want to for whatever reason, hit all-time highs last year and even going into the early parts of this year. It was completely unprecedented. Employees had optimal choice. It was truly their market. So a lot of the conversations we were having there, we were talking about talent shortages and talent wars and ensuring that we had, um, as organizations, the best employee value proposition uh, because we wanted to, to attract and retain absolutely the best talent. And that is why employee experience was so essential. We even had to go beyond engagement to create an environment where employees truly wanted to be, where they were thriving. And then, as you all have experienced your, yourselves, the coronavirus hit. And now the projections are that the U.S. alone will lose tens of millions of jobs. The unemployment rate will likely reach about 32%. So it is a vastly different world than the one that we were in just a few short weeks ago. So this was a chance then for us, a chance to do some original and very recent re research on what are the strengths and the struggles of, of working adults? Like what are people going through right now? So we gathered this data over the past, um, um, I should say, over um, about two weeks right after the announcement of um, coronavirus, when it was declared a pandemic. And we asked folks questions around, um, what does work like for you? What is life like for you? What, how are you dealing with stress? How are you coping in general? What are your thoughts about the future in this post-COVID reality? And so um, we did this research out of our Better Up Labs, and um, we included a broad population. These were not people that are um, Better Up customers. We just went for a broad swath of, of working professionals. And here's what we found, and I'll share this with you, and then I'll share a little bit of additional insight that we're getting actually from our own members. So the results were, were pretty striking. On the whole, people are not doing great, or they weren't at that time. They're reporting drops in their sleep quality, not surprisingly a reduction in their activity levels, and even an increase in worry and a feeling of pessimism about the future. But the experience actually wasn't the same for everyone. And what we actually found is that women are suffering a bit worse when it comes to sleep. Their quality of sleep is about 28% worse than that of, of their male counterparts. And they're experiencing much bigger drop-offs in workplace social support. And if there's anything here that's surprising to you, again, feel free to use that, that Q&A chat and we can look and see if you have any questions or thoughts or reactions to this. And as you're thinking about that, Here's a little bit more um, in terms of what we are finding with this data. This is where things are um, getting really interesting. We looked at people's sources of stress. So if you can imagine 
yourselves? What's the most stressful thing to you right now? Um, that was something that we were curious about. And we thought, well, gosh, there's now many people working from home. And so two groups of people came to mind for us. People who, like many of us here, are parents and are currently working with kids at their remote location. And then there's the other group of us who are non-parents, or maybe we are parents, but our kids just aren't in our remote location with us or in our current virtual work environment. So our goal was to understand what's the current experiences of these two groups and what we what can we learn from both groups about what it means to be effective when you're working remotely. So here's what we found. The first thing and the most striking is that kids are indeed a major source of workday stress when you're working remotely. So this is where we asked those two groups. What was their single biggest source of stress? The left are the ones without kids at home and the right are the ones with the kids at their home location. So this is probably something that's not surprising to you if you have coworkers who have kiddos um, at home or if you are one of those people yourselves. So kids are the biggest source of stress, um, you know, quite strikingly more so than customers, um, not even as stressful as technology or your boss. And you can even look down on the list. Um, spouses can be a source of stress as well, but nothing, nothing matches how stressful children are. Um, and then, of course, if you are not working with kids at home on the left, you see that customers and technology, as many of us probably experience, are our are, are top sources of stress. So then we said, OK, well, can we can we look under the hood a little bit more? And this is where it really becomes very fascinating. And though the mix of workday stressors changes for working parents, overall stress levels are actually identical, almost exactly the same. And this tells us that there's more to the story for how these groups manage and handle their stress differently. And when we unpackage this data, we find that there are really some key differences in the mindsets, the beliefs, the activities of working parents that explain how they're actually able to almost absorb this kind of surging source of workday stress, their, their, newest, um, their newest coworkers, and still maintain the same overall levels of stress. And so what we found in our data is that parents happen to be more psychologically prepared for change and uncertainty. They're more resilient. They have stronger coping skills and they're more optimistic about the future. Maybe because they have to be because they're, they're thinking about those little people that they have. And maybe working parents also have this stronger bonds with their companies. And in fact, our data showed us that that people with kids did have those stronger bonds. They're, they're able to feel more accepted and included by their company. They have a stronger belief that their company cares about their personal well-being. And um, maybe that's perhaps due to increased um, adoption of family-friendly policies that many organizations are, are implementing right now. And finally, um, we saw that though physical activity levels for both groups dropped after COVID-19, um, that the, the drop off was actually significantly less steep for working parents, possibly because uh, we have to engage in more activities with our kids. They, they keep us moving. I know for myself, I've got, I've got three little ones at home and they are getting me out more now than they ever have before. Um, it's like it, it, it's my survival mechanism is getting them outside as much as possible. OK, so here's the next interactive portion. I would love to hear a little bit from you if you feel comfortable. Would love to pause here and ask these questions of you. As much as we've shared thus far in the data, what has resonated for you? How are the employees at the organizations where, where you sit 
responding. Would love to know what here is ringing bells or is seeming like, gosh, like um, this is something that our folks are struggling with as well. What have you seen or experienced yourself in terms of how individuals at your organizations are responding? What do you, what do you think? Working remotely is tough. Everyone is pulling together. I love that. Absolutely. Okay. So feel free to have those coming in. Okay. So the question might be, is there a silver lining to all of this? And the good news is that, yes, there is a silver lining. And both in terms of how people are learning to adapt and to cope, um, the new skills that they're building, and in what we're able to discover about what conditions to um, that, that we need to help us thrive, both as employees and as individuals. So through the remainder of the talk, I'll share about what we've learned at Better Up about this, as well as some ideas for, for how to improve that employee experience for you. So now I'd love to shift gears just slightly. And here's where I'd like to share a bit more with you about what we're actually learning from our own members. So as Kate talked about, these are individuals who across the country, um, we have thousands of people at, um, at every type of organization in every time zone um, in the world who are experiencing some of this as well. And they are all engaging in one-on-one -on -one coaching. So what we're able to do is then look at the data that we're gathering from their experiences to see what has changed for them. And that's actually exactly what we asked them is what has changed for you at work? And it was a question similar to what I'm posing for you here. So feel free um, to respond um, using, again, A, B, C, D, E, F, or G. Um, what has changed for employees at your organization? And you can think about this. Are people now working from home more? And I, I saw like a comment earlier um, that people are. Um, are they um, furloughed? I just saw a, um, someone come in with a D that, gosh, you potentially have people who got furloughed or laid off. Uh, people are working more hours or less hours. Um, some folks are saying, gosh, there's no change. So we ask the same question of others. Um, and it isn't all that uh, that applies. I saw someone say that people are working from home and they now have more or new leadership responsibility. So all of this is happening. So that same question we asked of thousands of our members as well immediately after COVID, um, specifically around when it was declared a pandemic. And what we saw is that 60% of people have shifted to remote work. And in fact, we um, were sharing similar information. We gave a similar talk, Kate and I, to the ATD members, um, not AC, <laughs> but ATD. So it's um, the Association of Training Development Professionals, um, also in the Austin area. And in fact, 64% of them said in their organizations, people were working remotely. And in fact, I think it was the, the number was something like 35% of people said that they had um, new leadership responsibilities and about the same, it was also a quarter that said that they had additional work hours as well. So this kind of gives you a sense of what people are experiencing. And, and everyone in fact is coping very differently with that, that new reality. And what we're able to do at Better Up is see are there different kinds of people um, that we can almost like kind of bucket people into like per personas or personality types based on how folks are responding. So we measure quite a bit in terms of um, what are the skills and the capabilities that people, people have, the mindsets that they're coming into a development experience with. And based on that, right around COVID, we were able to see that there are, gosh, there are these three types of people that emerged in terms of how they were using um, coaching specifically to, to help them manage stress. 
And we saw this first group of people on the left. They're the feelers. Um, and I gave them these names. So maybe they're not the best names, but, but it kind of emerged as a theme in terms of um, the strengths that, that they were demonstrating. And this group of folks, they are high in emotional regulation, they're high in self-compassion, and they're high in, in empathy. They're in touch, they're aware, they're cognizant of their needs, and, and these folks are using more stress-related coaching. Now, there's this middle bucket of individuals. They are actually using less stress-related coaching. They're using coaching for other things. Um, they're getting more tactical. They're more focused on getting their work done. These are the folks that we saw are high in strategic planning and they're already high in rest. They're high in goal attainment and they're high in focus. So it's telling us that they're able to truly tune out the world around them. And they are, they're needing less stress-related coaching. They're leaning more towards that the practice. And then there's this third group of people. Um, they are using the same amount of stress-related coaching. They're kind of going about their, their normal coaching interactions. Um, and they're the ones, I named them the learner, and I know that the statues of the thinker, uh, but this kind of, it's kind of a thinking, learning mentality. These are people who are high in growth mindset. They're high in problem solving. They're already high in stress management and resilience. And this is really important because it's these capabilities that um, are showing us that people who are high in those and resilience and in coping skills, they actually do better on some of these other outcomes. So you can see like these are the folks who are holding steady. They see life as a marathon and not a sprint. So we thought this was really fascinating and we dug a little bit deeper and we said, well, what else can, can we see around how people are, are responding and what is really important to them? And what we saw is um, what I'm sharing with you here. And I thought you'd find this really interesting in terms of what are the top 10 coaching topics that we've seen? And this was in the course of, of March. That's where we saw that the most drastic change. And you can see that stress management and communication and collaboration are the three areas um, that really rose up to the top, okay? That they became really critical for folks. And in fact, stress management and self-care as a topic increased by 79%, the highest increase that we've ever seen at any time in our Better Up history. But things like a focus on people's career, on um, on um, communication and collaboration, uh, excuse me, on um, conflict uh, management, those decreased. On career planning, those decreased. Maybe because folks are really tuning in to um, helping them through the challenges of this time, uh, but from the mindset of how do I manage the stress? How do I help my team manage the stress? How do I ensure that communication channels are open and people are able to stay connected during this time? So we thought that was really interesting. And now here is where it got really fascinating. So this is, this is going to get a little wild here. So um, if you're looking away from the screen and just listening in, I would say look to the screen because things are going to get really dynamic here. So the next few slides are on um, what are folks searching for in our resource library. So on the back end of our um, coaching relationship, our platform also includes thousands and thousands of resources that our, our members and our coaches can, um, can search and get tools on. They can get tools, they can get additional learning. Um, we follow the micro learning mentality. They can get um, videos that teach them something or, or help unpackage a topic for them. And they can certainly get resources they can share with their teams as well. So what you're looking at here is a chart that's telling us what were the top um, resource library search terms this is the week of February 3, okay? And uh, what we did is we looked at what might be the search terms that would highly correlate with COVID, okay? And that what, what people actually search for together with COVID. So this is February 3. Now, 
I'm going to click next in my slides. And what you're going to see is how that search changed over the course of the next 10 weeks. And you can see that the, the week numbers are going by as this is changing. And you can see how those COVID related search terms are coming up on the list. Okay, their words like they're looking for resources related to remote work, to resilience, to uncertainty. All of them over the course of those 10 weeks floated up to the top. And here it is for you. And you can just kind of see, again, the yellow ones are COVID related. The kind of the bluish um, teal ones are not COVID related. And there's like week seven and week eight, which was like the epicenter. And I'll click next here just so um, I can capture this for you. And I really love this view. This is where you can see what specifically were some of those um, other search terms that were coming up in combination um, with COVID. And in fact, um, my favorite one is Brene Brown that's there in that box. Uh, I think because you probably came up with that, that latest podcast that has really been helping people through, through this typical time. But here's really an interesting um, kind of view. If you look at week eight and week 10 side by side, so week eight, probably when I think a lot of states um, declared state emergencies and schools closed and a lot of businesses closed. That was that week of I know in, in Washington state where, where I am in California, where our headquarters are, um, that week of, of March 23 was was the, the top. Of, of when when everything was closing and people were probably all starting to work remotely. And now week 10, which is just two weeks ago, things are starting to calm down a little bit. And in fact, when we asked people compared to two weeks ago, how is your well-being? 60% are already responding that their well-being is somewhat or much better. So we're already seeing things are improving. So some of you are probably wondering, OK, well, how does this relate to employee experience? And this is actually where, where we, we get into the nuts and bolts of like, what is that experience like during COVID or during a time of crisis? And that's what we'll dig into next. So I'd love to ask you first, you know, those of you who have ever heard the term before, or maybe you've never heard of the term employee experience. What does it mean for you? And again, um, feel free to bring that answer up in your mind, um, or you could also bring it into the Slido. Feel free to share it um, in the Q&A as well, um, and we'll, we'll talk about that. So what does employee experience mean to you? Now, when we think about it at Better Up, um, we think about it as the mindsets and perceptions that employees have in response to their involvement with their organization. But I actually like this, this even simpler way um, that this one author defined it in his article on employee experience. And he said that it is a positive employee experience is one that gets you out of bed on a rainy Tuesday morning, I did this little change, or I would say, or during a pandemic, while a negative employee experience is one that might make you consider calling in sick. And someone here in chat said, oh, they measure employee experience with um, NPS, like an employer, maybe NPS. Um, absolutely, that is a way to look at it as well. So that's a really simple way of thinking about employee experience. A positive one is one that where people want to show up to work. They're excited to be at work. And a negative one is that they really they just don't want to be there. So why do we ultimately look at employee experience? And the folks who were responding in in the chat here is um is it why do we bother asking um, if employees have the ability to grow, as someone said? Or is it why do we ask about NPS, for example? Well, a positive employee experience is actually linked to other benefits. Um, and we know that there's benefits for the employee's professional and personal thriving, such as productivity, their own productivity, 
to job satisfaction to, as someone said, um, it's actually linked to employer net promoter score. And at BetterUp, what we wanted to do is get more precise in the definition and understanding of what employee experience is. We call it the EX index. And so drawing on our own data set, spanning thousands of working professionals, we created the single index to serve as a reliable marker um, to, to baseline employee experience, to then benchmark, to track progress over time across individuals and across organizations. And this is what we found. So EX is comprised of six important elements that um, when they're present, create for that positive employee experience. So let me share with you what those six are. So the first is authenticity. Employees are inspired to bring their best selves to work every day. It's comprised of engagement. So employees find their work consistently energizing, engrossing, and invigorating. It's optimism. So employees approach new challenges with a positive, growth-oriented mindset. It's meaning and purpose. So employees believe that their work matters um, and positively impacts not just the people in their organization or the organization itself, but the world around them. They feel belonging. So they feel in the foster workplace belonging and inclusivity for themselves and for others. And finally, it's social connection. Employees have deep and mutually supportive connections with their work colleagues that surround them. And so here's what's interesting, and I think you all will appreciate this being a technology or um, group. And we, and we don't have space to kind of dig into it on, on this conversation today, but we were able to look at, well, how does employee experience look different across different kinds of organizations, across different groups, around people with a lot of tenure or with little tenure in an organization. By the way, there's no difference there. Um, we looked across leadership levels. Uh, but one thing that you all might appreciate is on average, we actually found that organizations in the IT or technology space, um, their employees, uh, again, on average, had a higher employee experience than employees at organizations in like the service industry, for example. Um, so there's some interesting things that we could probably um, dig into there. But I wanted to share that with you because I thought you all might appreciate it. But oftentimes, so folks say, well, gosh, is, is employee experience the same as engagement? And in fact, it, it isn't. And what we found is that the link between EX and employee productivity is six times higher than engagement alone. And to that individual who was saying, well, gosh, we, we measure employee experience with employer NPS. Um, in fact, it's a little bit even more uh, nuanced than that. But this shows you here that EX makes individuals um, stronger. So it's critical at that individual level. level. It's critical at the team level. And it also leads to, to organizational outcomes. Um, and it's something that we see that when EX is high, individual employee experience is high, it leads to 142% increase in employer NPS. Now you see in, in kind of the orange there, it also typically leads to um, a drop in turnover intentions and a drop in work group conflict. Interestingly enough, and I'll share this with you, as you might imagine, turnover, a little bit less of a concern right now. Okay, time for one more question that I'd love to get your thoughts on. So you're probably wondering, well, gosh, well, if turnover is not really a concern right now, but you're saying employer exper or employee experience is related to that plus all of these other outcomes, well, what is the importance of the employee experience right now during times of crisis or chaos or uncertainty? So I'd love to see um, you all share again in that Q&A chat, do you think employee experience changes during times of crisis? Do you think it matters more, less, or the same? What do you think? Let's see here. What are folks saying? Um, I have 
three A's thus far, um, and the rest of you are like, I'm not going to touch my phone right now. That's totally okay. Um, and so I'll, I'll take my three people as the big voters. And yes, it does matter more, in fact. And I'll tell you a little bit as to why. So what we were able to discover um, by, oh, oh, I love this. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to call this out because um, I love that we have a couple more um, comments here. So B, uncertainty, fear, and doubt quickly and naturally reduce employee experience. I want to call that out because you're absolutely right. Whoever came up with that really insightful comment that it does. Uncertainty, fear, and doubt do decrease the employee experience, which is probably why we're, we're all um, talking here today. And um, because, oh, thank you, Scott. I appreciate you um, sharing your name. Um, that was a really insightful comment, Scott. And we'll talk about why that is. Um, and this is where kind of the next part that we'll talk about is getting a little bit under the hood about what we discovered about employee experience during this time. So this may be helpful for you, Scott. You'll, you'll have some, some data maybe to, to back up your, your um, very insightful and maybe intuitive or, or well-informed thoughts there. So here's what we saw. What we were able to do, um, we were running another study, oddly enough, completely unrelated. This was before COVID happened, but we had just happened to collect data from, from again, thousands of um, U.S. workers. Um, they were not people who are, um, you know, benefiting from coaching with our organization today. And we had collected all of this data um, on them about their employee experience, plus some other things, because, again, it was the unrelated study. And um, we had their initial scores on employee experience. And then when COVID was declared a pandemic, we said, oh, my gosh, we have an opportunity. We can go back to those same people. And um, it, was, so it was about, I think, um, if I read a month, month, maybe a month and a half span of time that was different um, in terms of when we originally collected this data. And then we went back to them two weeks after it was declared a pandemic and we collected the same data. And what we saw is that um, authenticity for people is dipping. It's hard to bring your best self to work right now. Optimism was declining. So it's, it's seeing current challenges as opportunities was really hard. And um, maybe as, as Scott was saying, if you're feeling uncertain, if you're feeling doubt, um, if you're worried, it's hard to be optimistic, right? Um, social connection, you can see is um, it actually is starting to dip. This one was really interesting because um, as you all might imagine, there's a number of questions that that roll up into each of these dimensions that tell us how is someone doing with this aspect of their employee experience. And um, there were a couple of questions that were like solo um, and they were specifically about how well are you able to stay connected with coworkers um, during this time. And there are one or two questions that were about um, you reaching out to people. Um, so those were keeping things positive, but the actual ability to stay socially connected was really hard for people. And it was actually into the negative. So that one's a little bit of a mixed bag. Um, but what we also saw is that workers are, they're turning to their jobs for a source of belonging and purpose in their lives. And they're becoming more engaged at work, right? If if you're in ho at home and you're, you're looking for that place of stability, to some, it might be like that's what you're leaning into if you have that opportunity. Um, I imagine if you are no longer employed, it would be pretty hard to do that. Now, here's um, this interesting comparison that we were then able to do. And it's back to that silver lining and uh, maybe leading us into the tips that I'm going to share with you. When we compared this group, so again, people who were not, um, they're not affiliated with us, they were, they were just willing participants in our study. When we compared that group of people to our own members, so again, people who are getting coaching, that personal one-on-one -on -one support, um, it was a completely different story. 
So coaching, we found, not only protects against the decreases in authenticity and optimism, but it actually also substantially contributes to its development. And better up members also had larger gains than, than these non-members across all other employee experience components. These people are staying more engaged. They're finding even deeper sense of belonging with their organization. This is kind of what it looks like um, when you compare the people who are getting coaching from their organization versus who are not. So for one group, the employee experience is actually going up. And for the other, on average, it's going down. And in this COVID environment, employee experience now happens to be an even stronger driver of resilience and of life satisfaction. And not surprisingly, as I hinted at earlier, it is a weaker driver predictor of turnover intentions. But this does tell us that the experience our organization is creating, what we are creating for our own employees, is essential in building our resilience and our job satisfaction. It's essential in building the skills that people need to then be productive. So kind of bringing us full circle to that original work that I shared at the beginning of our time together, we found that when people who are higher in resilience and who are higher in optimism, they actually are coping better. They're sleeping better. They are more active. They have higher rates of social support. So there's something about those capabilities that are so critical to ensure that um, people are doing well, not just at work, but also um, in, in their personal lives as well. So that brings us to what can we do as good stewards of talent in our organization? And that's where I'll, I'll wrap us up today with a few of these recommendations that I'd love to share with you. And if you all have recommendations on what you are doing at your organization, or if you would just love to share what you have done that has worked for your employees, um, or what you've seen or um, your own leaders do that, that has been helpful, please share that with others so, so we can um, learn from each other. So, First, the first thing I'd love to share is uh, to improve the employee experience, help people bring their whole selves to work. And so what does that really mean? So this is where we talk about the importance of authenticity. For people to be able to bring their whole selves to work, they actually need um, a positive environment in which to do that. People will hold back, as Scott so astutely said, if um, they are uncertain right, if they are not sure what's going on. Um, and to bring your whole self to work, you need to have a place where people feel comfortable. So things like implementing um, a workplace gratitude challenge, um, uh, finding practices where you can appreciate the little wins, um, helping people develop relationships even more during this time is essential. And you're probably going, Maya, what are you talking about with encouraging plants and nature? Science actually tells us if you bring greenery into your workspace, and there have been studies on this, it's proven, just having um, a, a green plant at your desk boosts creativity, it boosts engagement at work, it creates that positive workspace. So give people these tips of face your desk towards a window, go walk outside, put a plant on your desk. It's, it can be that simple to start building that environment. So next, foster optimism. Help people train their brain for a more productive you. Okay, so help your employees lean into that growth mindset, even in the most chaotic of times. So that's helping people reframe a challenge as an opportunity or um, put on a completely different lens. So take that same situation, but put a different lens on it. And how can you see the positive in it? So there are um, these are kind of different techniques that leaders can can bring into their teams and um, the organization can institute. And um, another one that I really love is acknowledging the sphere of control there as well. OK, the next one is, of course, building resilience. So help people flourish. And research has actually shown that resilient people don't just overcome and bounce back to their previous status, they actually become stronger. 
they become a little bit more agile. They're able to deal better with those similar situations next time. So techniques there are that silver lining. So how can you look for the silver lining in the negative situation? Um, it's facing the fear. That, that is an actual technique of how do you take what's challenging, look it in the eyes, and move past it. Um, it's implementing self-compassion practices and helping build social connection. Those are critical for resilience. And finally, provide that personal development for people, whether you do it through coaching, through that one-on-one -on -one personal support, or you find other ways to do that in your workplace, we have found in, in our research that personalized development is the number one driver of having um, of people feeling meaning and purpose from their work and the number one driver of an overall employee experience. So if your organization supports your whole development, employees have a better experience. And this is something that one of our partners said, and I loved her quote, so I just took it because I couldn't have said it better myself, is the whole person is critical. That's why we call our, um, our measurement model is the whole person model. It's a mistake, she says, not to consider the whole person and everything that is going on in their world because it all comes together to impact how people show up every day. And that's something that I hope we, we leave you with today. And so as we wrap up now, and I would welcome, we can turn on Spotlight if we want to do that. Um, I would love for you all to reflect what learning will you apply immediately after you get off of this webinar, um, because we know um, that reflection is critical and that goal setting is critical to make change happen. And finally, I'll leave you with this final question where you can send in um, your, your responses in that Q&A on what might you be craving more information on? All right. That brings us to the end. I'll go ahead and turn it over to Amber, our host. And thank you all for letting us spend a bit of time with you today. Thank you so much, Maya and Kate. This was a very, very, for me at least as a leader, this was an extremely helpful virtual roundtable. And I took a lot of notes and answered a few questions myself as well. And I want to thank everybody for coming and spending your time with us today. We are going to keep the Slido open for 45 minutes after this presentation is done to give you the opportunity to ask more questions if things have come up. The Slido code, once again, sorry, I have to read it because I have a lot of these, uh, 33695. Again, that is 33695. So if you have any questions for the Better Up team, you can put those on Slido or you can email ATC at info at austintechnologycouncil.org. Again, that is info at austintechnologycouncil.org. And we can get you in touch with the Better Up team so that you can ask your questions directly. We are so happy to have everybody take part in these every single week. We do have a great program tomorrow morning with eBay. They are doing hiring here in town. So if you have any developers, specifically people with Java background who are currently looking for a job and need a new opportunity, eBay is growing and they are hiring here in Austin. So we'd love to have them take part in it. We also want to make sure that everybody's taking care of themselves. As the state begins to open on Friday, we want to make sure that everybody's making certain that they're wearing their masks when they go out and that they're making sure that they're keeping the social distancing in place. We've been very fortunate in Austin that our numbers have been low. We want to see them continue to be low. So take care with your teams. If you have questions about when is the right time to bring people back into your office and when is the right time to to you know, begin business as usual again, please reach out. ATC has a lot of member companies with a lot of resources and a lot of information, including data model sets on when is the safest time to proceed forward. And we're happy to put you in contact with them. You can use the info at email for that request as well, or you can reach out to me directly at amber at austintechnologycouncil.org. Again, it's amber at austintechnologycouncil.org. We want to make sure that you and your employees are safe and healthy and that when you do get back to business and you do get back into your offices, you're doing it in the most responsible way 
that makes your employees feel safe and makes you as leaders feel safe as well. We so look forward to seeing you all again soon in person, but in a safe environment as well. If you have any questions or there's anything that you need to reach out to us for, please do so at any time. We're here to serve our members every day and our goal is to always promote and support our members and their growth. And so I'd like to once again, thank Maya and Kate from Better Up for leading this great conversation today and to thank Starleaf as well for providing this platform for us to take, to take part in this every single week. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Please be safe and take care.